Okay, okay. take two. Take two, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. <laughs> it's my pleasure seeing you all. Uh, we have plenty of people, to be honest, more than I expected regarding this uh, topic. So today, Yevhen uh, Nedashkivsky is here. I'll be your host today. I am L&D manager in All Stars IT. It's worldwide outstaffing company, IT outstaffing company. I'll tell you more at the end, but it's my pleasure that uh, we are organizing these events. And today's guest is Anton Boyko. He is so software architect, or rather cloud architect. He's been working with cloud, I think, from the start <laughs> when those uh, this, techno no, this technology was just introduced. Uh, he is also organizer of uh, Asia Days, uh, Asia Meetups. Like uh, I think, Anton, you are not uh, focused on Asia, but you mostly work with this uh, Microsoft cloud provider. Is that, if I'm not mistaken, you may tell more uh, in a minute. Yes. Uh, and, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think Anton is uh, more than 15 years in IT sphere. Almost 20. Almost 20. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, Anton is also uh, Azure MVP, most valuable professional. Uh, what else? Frequent speaker. Uh, Microsoft person. Regional Director. Microsoft uh, Regional Director, by the way. Uh, I think I, I saw that only uh, Alexander Krakowetsky is. Man, you are spreading my knowledge about uh, yourself. I was awarded uh, the Regional Director Award uh, four years ago. I am happy that you are following me on the social media. It took only four, year, <laughs> four years for oh, you. It takes four years. Okay. So, uh, and what amazes me about Anton, actually, that uh, he's always on the edge of technology. He knows all the recent features in the cloud. Uh, he uh, quite good with all the quirky architecture stuff. And I do respect him as an expert and professional, and especially his ability to help people share his knowledge and uh, finding time, uh, helping us and uh, teaching us. Anton, thanks a lot for having you here. Uh, Anton today is talking about Docker and unorthodox usage of it. Anton, the word is yours. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Yevhen. So yeah, today, uh, as uh, we were already saying, uh, I would like to talk to you a bit about Docker. I don't have uh, any slides for today prepared, which is fine because today I would like to do some live demos and maybe have some live discussions. Those topics that I will present today, they are not, let's say, new in a way that it's something that came up recently. Uh, no, they are just showing you a bit of a different angle, a bit of a different approach, a different point of view that you can at least consider when you are working on your projects. Okay, so uh, let me start with the following. So let me share, uh, or maybe before even I will share my screen, okay? So let me talk a bit more on what will be the general, let's say, scope of the conversation today. So uh, we uh, currently, I'm working in a startup. The startup is named Perfection. Uh, Yevhan was presenting me as the uh, architect, but in that particular startup, I'm actually playing the role of chief infrastructure or, uh, chief infrastructure officer. I'm responsible for everything that is related to the infrastructure, uh, and we are. I mean, we were named perfection uh for a reason so we're trying to do some things but we're trying to make them really perfect we actually struggle uh also with that and we are struggle because it's always hard for us to release new versions because we want to make them perfect before we will roll them out to the public audience but nonetheless today we're talking not uh really about that today we're talking about how we actually use 
all of those kind of technologies, how we use Docker in our projects in the, to be more successful. So the first thing is that when you're when you are talking on the word, you're listening to the conversation about Docker, then what will be actually, let's say, most common thing that is discussed uh, when you are talking about the Docker or containers? It almost every every time about how I can pack my application, how I can wrap it in the container and then deploy, ship, whatever, whatever. And yes, of course, this is probably like the 95% cases uh, that covers the usage of the containerization and Docker in particular, but still we have those five cases that are mostly just, you know, kind of omitted during the conversations and conferences and so on and so forth. Let me actually uh, draw a quick live pool here. So can you just uh, send a plus to the chat if you are at least somehow related to any automation, any pipeline that is happening on your projects. For example, you are participating uh, in uh, creating some build pipelines or deploy pipelines, or you run those pipelines and so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, I see uh, some pluses in a chat. I was actually expecting that basically all of the chat will be in pluses. Maybe it's just my internet is so slow today uh, because I can see that new pluses are coming up. So uh, the thing that happens not really so often, but still it happens a lot, uh, at least in my experience, maybe it's because of my karma or maybe because I'm working on a lot of projects uh, in parallel as well. So uh, the thing is the following. When you have a small team and when you are creating a product, when you're creating your automation, it's not always that you can afford, you know, build to build your own pipeline system. So in most cases, you're taking something like, GitHub or Azure DevOps or GitLab or something else, and you use that as a service because, because it's much easier. It makes more sense. And then you may say, you know what? We will be using the managed agents as well. I don't want to uh, create my own virtual machines. I don't want to install all of the components of those virtual machines. No, the provider provides me with the virtual machine and with the agent that is deployed to that virtual machine, and I will use that. But let me ask you the question, what is happening when provider starts to update the software on that machine? In most of the cases, uh, this is actually for the good because you have the latest security patches and so on and so forth. But in some cases, it may actually do more harm. Uh, let me give you one of the examples. So there used to be a bug uh, in Microsoft Azure CLI version 2.4.2, if I'm not mistaken. And some of the commands, and here I'm talking exactly about commands that you use uh, inside the CLI to start or stop your Azure app service. Those commands, they had that bug and they were unable to run. So you're using exactly the same syntax you're using all of the things exactly as you used them before but because provider rolls up the new version of the cla they updated the agent suddenly your pipelines stopped working and this is the thing that actually happens to me uh more time that uh that I wanted. And uh, the first thing that I would like to talk to you today is how you can try to solve that. And we solve that with Docker. So let me show you a very simple way of how we did that. And now I will share my screen. Uh, okay, I'm sharing my screen. I just, wait a sec, I want to... Yeah. I'm sure on my screen for now it's empty, but it's about to change. So what we actually did, uh, we've created, first of all, we've created a Docker image, okay? A very simple Docker image 
that basically contains all of the tools that we need to run those jobs in our pipelines. You can see uh you, you can see it right here. So uh, we're basically using the Ubuntu uh, as a base image. Uh, here I'm just defining which exact versions of the software I will install inside that Docker image. For example, I'm saying, okay, I need to have the Node.js ver version uh, 19. I need to have Terraform. I need to have Azure CLI and la la la, a bunch of other stuff. And then... I'm basically installing all of them here like this. Very, very simple Docker file, like super simple. And what I can do then, and the majority of the uh, the majority of the modern, let's say, uh, build systems are supporting that already out of the box, that when I'm creating my pipeline, I can actually say that, hey, I want to use uh, not the built-in agent, but I want to run that build from within uh, the Docker image. Uh, just give me a second. I will find. Uh, I will find one of those pipelines, and then I will show it to you. I do believe that this is the pipeline that I am looking for. Let me just double check that. Uh, uh, oh come on! I I lost the pipeline that I was looking for. Uh, okay, sorry for that. Give me a sec. I will try to find that pipeline really, really fast. I just have a lot of things opened here, and uh, that's why those things unfortunately can happen. Uh, okay, uh, let me let me try to do that together with you. I will also show you uh, how we're working with the Azure DevOps. I do believe that I can take this one. Can I? Yeah. Anton, I think yeah. uh, a lot of people know what the Docker image is but they not all are familiar with Azure pipelines. Can you tell uh, a bit more about this? Yeah, I'm just, uh, as I was saying, sorry for that. I'm just looking for the uh, for the uh, good example. I'm looking for the example and, and I cannot find, okay, uh, let me try one more pipeline. Let me try one more pipeline. So the, the idea here is that, yes, let me talk a bit about Azure DevOps then. So uh, the idea here is that Azure DevOps is the service uh, that basically uh, combines four major areas. Uh, and uh, those four major areas, uh, they include working with the tasks, they include working with the code, uh, they include uh, working with the uh, pipelines uh, and tests, and also with some uh, artifacts. Oh, here, finally, I found it. So, uh, for example, this is the example of the pipeline. Uh, that we are using to deploy the infrastructure for our identity platform. So uh, I will not uh, basically show uh, the first part of the pipeline because it's not important for now. It's not important how we are deploying uh, our Azure infrastructure. Uh, but the thing that I wanted to show here, uh, or maybe let me show that for a moment. So. For, first of all, we're deploying our infrastructure in this pipeline, and we have a set of uh, pretty much uh, common attributes. I'm defining the job, the display name. I'm saying that I will need to use the clean workspace. And then I'm saying, okay, now I will have my steps. And now I have my uh, pipeline steps, like checking out the code, running this task, running that task, and so on and so forth. So this looks pretty much exactly uh, as any other pipeline. But here, the second part, when I'm deploying the DNS, when I need to deploy the DNS, I'm deploying that with the Terraform. The reason for that is because we're using Cloudflare to manage our DNS and uh, for the Cloudflare, 
Terraform is pretty much the only one option. So if uh, if for AWS, for example, you have the Cloudflare, uh, which is, uh, let's say, not really uh, a way how you create it. it it's, it's not really um, an easy and simple and transparent way for you to create the infrastructure. So that's why for the AWS, most of the folks prefer to use Terraform. For Azure, you have options like use IRM, Bytesup, or Terraform, for example. For the Cloudflare, you don't have that op those options at all. Ter Terraform is the only one possible way. Because otherwise, you will need to call the API directly. And believe me, you don't want to do that. So this part of the pipeline, as you can see, the content of the pipeline is actually exactly the same. But... I have those three magic lines here. So I'm just saying that, okay, this part of the pipeline, this particular job and all of the steps that I have within this job, I would like to run them inside the container. And when I'm doing that, I'm providing basically true properties. I'm providing uh, the endpoint. So I'm saying that uh, in in some other place here in the project settings, I will not go there right now. In the project settings, uh, I'm creating a connection between my instance of the Azure DevOps and any other container registry. Uh, and then I'm saying that from that container registry, please pull this particular image. So the container registry is called Perfection Tools and the image is called uh, AZ DevOps Pipeline. And here I am providing the version of that image, which is 3.0.3.1.4. And that's it. And if I will look at the logs of that pipeline, uh, p -p 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 infrastructure deploy prod, for example. Let me open the last one. So if I will look at the logs for deploy DNS configuration, you can see that the first step is initialize containers. And what it's doing here is basically connecting to the Docker registry and uh, it's pulling that Docker image and then it's running all of those steps inside that Docker image. So the big idea about that, the reason behind that is if you're using that, you are now using Docker or like the containers themselves in the way how they meant to be, in the way how they were designed originally. You're using them as the distribution platform. But the distribution platform doesn't always mean the distribution platform specifically for your app. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so here you can manage yourself which exact versions of your tools you will be using. And at the same point, because you can use that on top of the managed instances, on top of the VMs and other stuff that are managed by the vendor, in my case, by Microsoft, the Microsoft will be responsible for all of the updates for the underlying Docker host, which includes the security updates as well. And at the same time, I have the full control over which exact versions of the tools will be used for my build pipelines. And uh, yeah, and that's why, and that's why I actually like that so much because it may, it may be, and it's actually one of the cases here is that, for example, we are using Terraform. And uh, by default, Terraform is not installed on Azure DevOps uh, build agents. So that basically means that either I need to create a script which will install the Terraform each and every run, uh, like that will be the first step in my pipeline to install Terraform uh, for each and every run, or I need to create my own virtual machine, install the Azure DevOps agent or any other pipeline agent on that machine, install Terraform, and then manage all of that. So with this one, it actually simplifies that uh, management by a lot. And in addition to that, in addition to that, if something on the build agent is not working exactly as you expecting, okay, if something is misbehaving, you're unable to run some commands and so on and so forth, then again, look, you have the Docker image. So what you can do, you can pull it yourself, 
to your local machine and then you can try to run those commands from within that docker image on your machine locally so you can easily debug the environment where your pipelines are running so this is the first thing that uh, I would like to talk to you about. And in addition to that, maybe uh, let me actually do that really quick. Uh, let me um, let me actually try to open one of my demo projects here. If I remember, it's something like this. And I just want to show you one interesting thing about the pipeline. If I still have that uh, if I still have that, let me just check that. Uh, mm, no. Okay. Anyway, I don't have, uh, or maybe I have that here in this demo. No. Okay. Anyway, I will not, uh, I will not do that now, but, uh, the other demo that, uh, I wanted to show. I don't have it right now. Uh, so let's not waste any time on that. Uh, the demo was dedicated to uh, how it actually works. So I was running that pipeline without the container, and then I was executing the simple script like, uh, hey, what is the current operational system? And then I've created my Docker image, and then I run that again, and then I basically the pipeline was exactly the same, only that uh, one attribute on top, the containers, uh, basically was in place, and I was just showing that uh, it will return the different version of the uh, of the operational system. So the question that I have in the chat is: uh, Is it works only with Azure pipelines, or the same for GitLab? Uh, as I was saying, uh, it uh, should work exactly the same for all the modern systems, uh, and GitLab qualifies as a modern system, at least to me. To be honest, I didn't try that in a GitLab, but. I've tried that on Azure DevOps and I've tried that on the GitHub. And you, you're probably aware that uh, all of those systems, they are competing really heavily for the users. Uh, so I will assume that if that feature is already present in Azure DevOps and in the GitHub, and it was there for a long, long time, actually, I do believe the same feature should be available for the GitLab as well. If I remember correctly, uh, there is one uh, other build system that I was uh, working with. Uh, that was the Bitbucket. I am really opinionated about the Bitbucket and not in a good way, of course. Uh, but even within the Bitbucket, I do believe it was the year 2018 or something like that. So approximately five years ago, the only way how Bitbucket supported their builds was to run those builds inside the Docker containers. So based on that, I'm assuming that uh, all of the other things are supported, uh, like all the things are supported uh, in the GitLab as well. Okay, so that was the first part. Another part, the second part uh, of this conversation uh, is related to how you can be more productive and still maintain a reasonable budget for your uh, for your project so look what is what is the core problem at, problem here so the core problem here is that at some point you may have like your production environment and you understand okay we don't want to deploy direct to production we want to have at least a few other environments okay so we have like dev QA stage whatever but now, as a developer, you are creating some service and you, oh, that was, uh, okay, that was a phone call, uh, sorry. But at some point you are creating a service, you're creating a service and then you can locally try whatever the service can work with the other services, okay? And then you may need to create, let's say some, content for this service or you maybe want to share that new version of the service with someone else but the problem here is that if you will override the dev environment then 
you may actually interrupt with some other uh, workflows that are happening right now because maybe someone, uh, some other person is creating something and he that person is using the dev uh, environment and you will be deploying the new version uh, and you can uh, basically interrupt that person's work. Of course, if you have multiple environments, you can deploy it to QA if no one is using QA right now and so on and so forth. But usually it forces you to have like, you know, a lot of those administrative work and it forces you to have a lot of those different communications in the chat that, hey, who is using the dev environment? Can I deploy it there? And so on and so forth. So it will be nice if we can say, okay, let's deploy a new version of our service, but let's use a very, very simple and cheap host, which will have a really short living time because I may need to deploy that only for two or four hours. Okay. So what we were using for that, all of our APIs, they were already wrapped in uh, containers. They were already using Dockers and all of our front-end apps, they were also using Docker. Uh, and uh, we had a set of environments and as a hosting platform, we were using the Azure App Service. Uh, the reason why we were using Azure App Service, uh, it's because it's much easier, especially for me to manage because in our startup, we don't have a lot of uh, engineers. We don't have a lot of free hands. So that's why we were uh, going to, let's say, use as much managed services as possible. I don't want to go with the Kubernetes from the day one, because if I will introduce the Kubernetes from the day one, then it will mean that in this particular startup, I will be doing Kubernetes only. And I don't want to do that. Uh, I want to do a lot of other stuff. And now infrastructure, it's actually all maybe like 30-ish percent of my work. I also do in a lot of other stuff here. Uh, so that's why I went with the Azure App Service. And maybe in your case, uh, you are using Azure App Service or you're using any other uh, uh, cloud services or maybe using the VMs. Don't really matter here. So the question here is that what will be a cost efficient and the simple way for you to deploy your app uh, and to provide an access to that app to the outside world. So for that, uh, we were using the Azure service called Azure Container Instances. Uh, let me actually open a new window and Azure Container Instances. That was the name of the service. So uh, what this service is about, this is actually a really cool and powerful and to some degree even underestimated service. So the Azure Container Instances, they are allow you to spin up a Docker, a Docker image. They allow you to spin up the Docker image in a, in a matter of few seconds. They do not provide you any orchestration like the Kubernetes does, but if the only thing that you need is to have a host for your Docker image that you can use and you can deploy there in under one minute, uh, then Azure Container Instances uh, are the best option for you to go with. Let me show you how we did that. So for now, uh, I would like to start with the, uh, where it was, okay. So uh, this is uh, this is actually one of the APIs that we have. Uh, so this is the .NET API. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, .NET API, it uh, serves the, this is the API for our identity platform. And here I have uh, basically a pretty much regular Docker file, uh, a multi-stage Docker file that helps me to build that API. So from the Docker file perspective, nothing, again, nothing out of ordinary. So you are creating your Docker file in the same way as you are creating uh, the Docker file for any other purpose. And then 
in the same case, in, 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 in the same way, you are publishing the Docker file to the Docker registry again, exactly in the same way. So now let's say that you already have your API or your app wrapped in uh, in Docker. And now you say, okay, I want to start using container instances. So what I need to add here to be able to use container instances. There are a few options how you can do that, but let me show you the way uh, how we did that. So first of all, you need to create, you need to create uh, a file, a uh, container group file, which looks almost like the Docker Compose file. Uh, I don't want to use the, the Docker Compose term here, but let's say that it was heavily inspired by the Docker Compose. Unfortunately, it's still kind of a proprietary format uh, of Microsoft Azure, uh, but Anyway, I mean, like you can see here that we have the name, the API version, the location, the extra to, to which exact data center you want to deploy it. And then in the same way as we're doing that with the Docker Compose, we're starting to define our uh, our containers here. So I'm saying, okay, I also want to have the database. I will not use the database from the dev environment. Please spin it up inside the, the Docker container. I'm also using the DB design project. The DB design project is actually uh, a way how we work with the entity framework, how we manage the test data with the entity framework and how we manage the schemas and migrations and so on and so forth. So the idea is, is that the DB design project is basically a console app. And before you're running your application, you're running this console app. It will run for like a minute or whatever, really, really fast. And it will create the schema inside the database. Uh, and it will also populate the database with the test data. This part is also crucial. Uh, the reason for that, it's uh, not because it's not because uh, you are working with Azure or container instances or some, something like that. It's more due to the nature of how you work with those temporarily ad hoc environments because you're spinning them up really fast, but the time to live is, I don't know, like a few hours. So that's why if you will uh, spin them up with the clean database, you will be unable to be productive, as I was saying. So that's why you need to spin them up with some test data. Uh, and then I'm basically saying that, okay, and the last but not least is my API. Uh, and uh, uh, here I'm defining that I want my API to be available on uh, this particular port number. And then here I'm just setting up some environment variables uh, that I need to have to make my API running. Uh, that's basically it. So this, this is kind of a proprietary format, uh, but still, as I was saying, it's inspired by the uh, Docker Compose. And then to deploy all of that, let me show you how the actual uh, deploy, uh, how the actual deploy pipeline works. I do believe it's here. Yes. So uh, this is my uh, ad hoc pipeline. Okay. So uh, what I'm doing here, uh, I'm basically uh, connecting uh, through my Azure registry. Okay. This is, this is actually not important. Yeah. This is the important part. Deploy all. Okay. So what I'm doing here, I'm doing kind of an interesting trick, uh, because let me, let me first show you how you can run that pipeline. If you want to run that pipeline, uh, you will need to specify, first of all, you will need to specify some of the key configuration uh, attributes for that pipeline. For example, if you want to create this uh, temporary environment and you want to connect that uh, to some other environments, uh, I don't know why it's so slow. Okay. 
Uh, let me just show you that pipeline. Deploy ad hoc, run pipeline. So uh, first of all, uh, when I'm running the ad, when I'm uh, deploying the identity API, I have one of the configurations that I need to provide. For example, the admin panel URL. And uh, by default, as you can see, it's now pointing to my built-in uh, dev environment. And uh, if I want, I can easily provide any other URL here. And then when it will provision the identity platform, it will connect that to another instance of the admin UI. And additionally, uh, I can say that uh, I want to remove that environment automatically in uh, after some amount of minutes. And by default, here I have zero. Uh, I have zero, which actually means that I will remove that environment at the end of the day. Okay. Uh, so uh, secrets in pipeline, good or bad? Uh, well, let me get back to this question in a few moments. For now, the uh, I, well, what I wanted to show, I wanted to show that uh, one of the other interesting features that we implemented is the amount of minutes that this environment will stay there. Uh, let me open, yeah, let me open uh, this one here. So uh, yeah, some of the secrets we have in the pipeline, uh, of course, for example, the SQL password, uh, but, this SQL password, it's the SQL password for that instance of the SQL uh, that we deploy together uh, with this ad hoc environment. Uh, then we're checking what will be the removal strategy. So we have two removal strategies. As I was saying, uh, it can be either, sorry, it can be either a delay and if it's a delay, it will mean that we will remove automatically that environment after n minutes, as I was showing. If it's schedule, uh, that means that someone left zero there, but uh, somewhere around, I don't remember exactly, it was something like 8 p.m. or 10 p.m., I don't remember exactly, I will run a pipeline on the schedule, and that pipeline will basically clean up all of those ad hoc environments for me. And I will also show how we're doing that. Uh, now uh, we're just using basically some very, very simple uh, string replace uh, functions. And we are replacing all of those configuration values with the values that we need to use. Uh, and uh, that's it. And then we are running uh, a very simple command, we're running the Azure CLI script. We are using that YAML file with the replaced values uh, to deploy the container instance with uh, all of those services there. Uh, what we're doing then, uh, the idea here is that each and every time when you are deploying that environment, let me actually, you know what, let me actually trigger that pipeline right now. Let me trigger the pipeline right now so I will show you how it actually works. So each and every time when you are doing that, we are creating a unique URL and that URL is based on the current date. Uh, it's based uh, on the how many times you run this pipeline this day and so on and so forth. And what we're doing here uh, we're basically providing you in the logs of the build pipeline. We're providing you with the exact URL that you will be able to use to go to the Azure portal and see your resources there. Uh, then we are delaying our pipeline for that amount of minutes that was specified during the run. An important thing to say about this particular delay job here is that, look, it uses pool server. What it actually means in the context of the Azure DevOps and in the context of, again, any other build system, 
if you will just delay your pipeline doing something uh, that may look like the thread sleep in your favorite programming language and so on and so forth, uh, then you will realize that you will actually not only block your pipeline, but because your pipeline technically still consider it as running, you will also block like all of the other pipelines uh, basically in your uh, in your build queue. And we, of course, don't want to do that. And the Azure DevOps, it allows us you to use this special pool of tasks called server. So in that case, if you're running your delay task, like here, if you're running the delay task, but not on the agent, but on server, you're not blocking that queue. So you will pause the execution of your pipeline for the specified amount of minutes, okay? But because you are using the server pool, you it will not affect the build queue. If there are other jobs in a queue to run, it will pause here, this instance will pause here, and then it will basically give the control to the other jobs and the other jobs will be able to do their work. And then after the delay, we have the task that basically removes all of that infrastructure. So let me actually, uh, oh, okay. Uh, Oh, I do believe, uh, yeah, I do believe I know why it's, why it happens. Let me, uh, let me try to run that again. So the thing is, is that I was probably trying to reference some really, really old image there. Uh, no. Hmm. Okay, let me let me try to run that again. I hope that it will work. If it's not, it will mean that I will have something to work on tomorrow. Let me actually use this branch because that was the latest branch with the latest changes. Uh, but while that one is running, let's still go here and let's... Uh, uh, try to also investigate what was happening here. Okay, the deploy failed. Inaccessible image. Hmm. Oh, I know why that image is unaccessible. Yeah, I know why that image is unaccessible. Yeah, uh, that means that no one was using uh, this pipeline for the last few days uh, because this is exactly what we've changed. Uh, yes. So the thing, uh, what we've changed, we moved to the different subscriptions. So that's why it's trying to look uh, for the container registry on the NPM subscription, but it actually needs to be on the different subscription. And that's why it's unable to find that. And that's why it's failing. Uh, which is a pity. Uh, let me try. Let me try to understand. Uh, can I fix that? Uh, really quick or not. Registry. Container registries. Let me just check if... Uh, if it's the same name, then I can actually fix that really quick and we can run. Okay, no, okay. So this container registry is still there. So maybe we just need to take an image uh, that is a bit more ancient. For example, 2023-08-1502. Okay, let's try to do that. Look how we're doing the live debugging right during the meetup. Isn't that fun? Okay, let's try to use this one. Run. Hope it will work now. But uh, the thing, uh, the thing that I would like to show, I would like to show 
how we will deploy the infrastructure, how we will show the ad hoc environment status in the console, and then how we will delay the pipeline for the 60 minutes. Uh, and then after 60 minutes, uh, if we will still have the Q&A active, I will show that it was actually removed. But my main point here is that the Azure Container instances, they allow you to spin up those Docker hosts really, really fast. And the thing is, is that I was also promising that you will be able to maintain a really reasonable price for that. So uh, let me open again this page and let me show you the pricing uh, for the container instances. Okay, so here is the actual pricing table. Uh, let's not use the central US because the price may differ, but yeah, anyway, let's use the central US. So when you are creating a container instance, you are requesting an amount of CPU and RAM for your containers. Inside your container group file, that is the reason why I was saying that it was inspired by the Docker Compose. I'm saying, okay, for the database, I will need half of the CPU. Uh, for the DB design, I will need to have one CPU. And then for the API itself, uh, oh, no. For the API itself, half of the CPU as well, because the DB design tool will run for less than a minute and then it will shut down. Uh, then we can consider that we will not pay for it at all. So half of the CPU here, half of the CPU here, so one CPU in total. Now we have memory in gigabytes, one gigabyte here and one and a half gigabyte for the SQL server. So that means one CPU and two and a half gigs of RAM, okay? And now let's try to calculate uh, what it will basically uh, cost for us to run that temporary environment for one day. Let's even consider that it will be not one day, like eight hours. Let's say that it will be one day, uh, that is 12 hours, okay? So I will open the uh, regular calculator here. So what we will need to do, first of all, memory. And here, look, we have prices per hour. So memory, it's 0 0.00533. And this is per gigabyte. We calculated that we need to have 2.5 gigabytes and we need to have it for 12 hours. So that basically means 16 cents for the memory, okay? Now let's do CPU. Let's kind of, you know, remember 16 cents, 0, 4, 8, 6, okay? 6, 0, like here, anyway. So this is the CPU, one CPU, so we will not multiply it by one, and then multiply that by the 12 hours, and then plus 0 0.16 cents, so around 75 cents. So what it actually means, it means that to run an ad hoc environment that I can spin up in less than one minute, to run that environment for the API and a database, a totally separated uh, kind of a instance of a service that I can connect uh, to basically uh, any other instance of my service in to, to any other environment, it will cost me 75 cents per 12 hours, per really, really long working day. The big idea is here is that uh, I don't know when was the last time uh, you drive to McDonald's. Uh, I drive to McDonald's uh, actually a few days ago. And uh, when I was paying for the cup of coffee, a regular cup of coffee in McDonald's, it costs me more than 75 cents here. It costs me actually uh, something like uh, 1.2 dollars so i can run that environment 
for almost 24 hours for the price of one cup of coffee in McDonald's, not in Starbucks, in McDonald's. And the big idea here is that you're usually using those temporary environments if you need uh, to, as I was saying, do some demo. If you need to deploy something really fast, check whether it's work, validate the concept, maybe show that to someone, and then you need to destroy it. So this is the exact use case for those kind of environments. Uh, let's check how our pipelines are going. Uh, okay, no, those pipelines. Hey, look, when I choose the ancient version uh, of the build image, which was there inside that uh, container registry, it works perfectly. So as you can see, the application deployed took less than two minutes on total. And here we have the ad hoc environment status. Uh, we can go to this task. And here we have, look, inside the echo, we have the link to the portal. So uh, we can open it. Or if I remember correctly, let me check that. Oh, no, I don't have it here. Okay, I was just playing with uh, some cool stuff, but uh, maybe not, maybe not on this project. Anyway, so I can open this link here. And I will be redirected to the Azure portal. And I will be redirected to the exact resource group where I have my uh, container instance deployed. I can go here. And I can see the CPU consumption, the memory consumption, and so on and so forth. I can go to containers. And I can see that, okay, I have the DB container, which is running. I have the DB, DB design, uh, which was uh, terminated. Uh, the reason for that is because, as I was saying, the DB design is just a console app that needs to run based with the test data, and that's it. Uh, and then I have the API. So uh, looks like everything is working fine. Uh, let's, uh, let's try to do what? Let's try to connect to this API. So, uh, I'm using this fully qualified domain name. As you can see, as I was saying, we're trying to generate the unique name each and every time. So I will do HTTP. I will do this one. Uh, I'm using the port, uh, 8080. And let's try to look for the swagger endpoint. Hey, look. My API works awesome. Uh, my API works and it's awesome by definition. Uh, so yeah, uh, with this kind of a demo, I would I, I showed you uh, how it can work. And let me just open again the Azure DevOps and that pipeline. And here, look, uh, this one still counts as running. But again, because as I was saying, because it's using the um, server pool, then this delay and this part of the pipeline, it doesn't count towards the amount of the parallel builds that or the amount of the parallel pipelines that you can actually run. And this is the beauty of it. So I can run any other things in parallel. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, uh, this, this will pause here and the other thing may run uh, in parallel. Uh, one of the other things that I wanted to show uh, is that uh, what we're using here, uh, we are using some tags on the Azure resource group. Uh, we're specifying that this is the ad hoc environment and we're specifying that the removal strategy is delayed. Uh, why we need that? Uh, because uh, we have one more pipeline. Let me show that pipeline to you. Uh, I do believe it's... Uh... No, oh, it's ad hoc. It's ad hoc deprovision all, yes. So uh, inside this pipeline, inside the deprovision all pipeline, what we're actually doing, uh, we are running the cleanup script. And uh, 
inside that cleanup script products ad hoc and cleanup script uh, okay topologies cleanup script yes so do we check those tags in the code itself uh yes this is exactly uh what, what i'm showing so i have this script here uh and uh i what i'm basically doing i'm saying that uh please give me I'm, I'm using the Azure CLI and I'm asking the Azure uh, Management API, please give me all of the resource group where I have the tag name removal strategy and the value is scheduled, okay? Uh, here I have the removal strategy delayed, not scheduled by delay, but, but delay, which means that this particular environment will be removed, will be removed uh, by the uh, pipeline itself. But if I will run this pipeline again, uh, I don't remember actually which exact, uh, oh, I have it here, perfect. So this is the version I need to use to make it work. Okay, uh, but now look, I will uh, I will keep zero here. I will keep zero, which will basically mean that uh, this one needs to be removed automatically. Uh, I mean, like automatically, but on the schedule. I will run it again, and it will create a new resource group with the new uh, ad hoc environment. Inside that environment, the removal strategy tag will uh, will be using scheduled, and based on this script that runs in parallel, it uses actually two other custom scripts. Let me show them. Uh, it uses the get resource group names by tag. Uh, which is underneath using the Azure CLI command az group list. Uh, using the custom query uh, to get the list of the resource group, which basically has this tag uh, equals to that value. And then in a loop, in a loop, it's just, it, it just delete those groups. Using another script, uh, which is underneath using uh, az group delete. A lot of things that uh, I've talked through in this second part uh, of the demo, but uh, let me just try to summarize the key points here. If you need a simple uh, ad hoc version of your environment, if you're working with the Azure Cloud, you can do that with Azure Container Instances. For other clouds, I do believe there are alternatives. I may not remember the exact names, but believe me, there are alternatives in other clouds as well. As I was showing you this calculation, it will cost you peanuts, okay? Because if you want to do something big, if you want to do the new release to the dev, uh, then it uh, you can just deploy to the shared dev environment. If you need to do the temporary release for a few hours, Again, it will cost you really peanuts. We were talking that this uh, is the calculation for the 12 hours. So let me divide that by 12. So one hour will cost you six cents. One hour of this environment will cost you only six cents. And then you are creating a few pipelines uh, that are relatively simple and straightforward to first of all, deploy that new environment, and second, through deprovision that environment. Uh, the pipeline that uh, I've triggered here, um, okay, this one, uh, oh, okay, this one failed, again, because uh, I thought that I've provided the correct version, uh, but it seems like Oh, wait, 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 wait. Let me do that again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it may, maybe I'll just press on the wrong button there. But anyway, 
so those are uh those are the second part the, those were the second part of the d demos that i have uh, I've showed you how you can use those ad hoc environments, uh, and I've showed you that it costs uh, really cheap. The only one thing that, to be honest, I'm not really happy about uh, is that you need to manage this uh, container group file. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the support for the docker compose itself is still in the preview it's more like the experimental format uh so uh, i do believe that at some point when from the preview they will switch that to the uh general availability uh the experience with the docker compose file will be better in that case it will basically simplify things by a lot because you will not need to manage yet another version of something that looks like docker compose uh, but for now in all of that approach the only one disadvantage is that you need to have this container group yaml file uh, which has all of those attributes specific to the azure container instances okay uh yep uh Sorry, uh, yeah, but if you need to go, feel free to go. I hope that you either learned something new or at least that was somehow valuable. As I was saying, that's everything that I have for you for today. So uh, do we have any uh, questions or kind of a topics that uh, you want to discuss further? Anton, uh, I have one question. Uh, meanwhile, mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, everyone, uh, uh, you are muted, but you may uh, raise your hand or write your question into the chat. Uh, Anton, you mentioned quite low prices on those, uh, I wanted to say machines, but they mm -hmm. are co containers. Mm -hmm. uh, as I may uh, understand, it depends. So what makes them so cheap? Like uh, it, it depends on operating systems, uh, size, what's inside. Like I, I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to spend some uh, money uh, without knowing it. Uh -huh. Yeah, so the billing model for the Asia container instances works in the following way. So uh, first of all, of course, you can get the Linux operational system, but also you can get, get the Windows operational system, which is a bit more expensive. Uh, but let's assume that you don't need to use Windows containers because those are really, really rare cases. To be honest, uh, in my practice, I never met the case when I was forced to use the Windows based container. I know a guy who used to have that on one of his projects, but again, it was one project during his like 20 years uh, IT career. So let's say that you are doing the Linux containers, okay? Now you have a price that you need to pay for one hour of uh, memory and one hour of CPU. And here if you're comparing that to the virtual machines, so when you're basically doing virtual machines in the cloud, you have those fixed pricing tiers, okay? Like two CPUs and seven gigs of RAM. And if you need to have like five CPUs and only one gig of RAM for some unknown reason, I don't know, whatever, you cannot have that kind of a virtual machine because there are no price and tier for that. That basically means that you either need to have less CPU and more RAM or something like that. So with the Asia container instances, you can, if you need to have five CPUs and one gig of RAM, it's possible. You're specifying five CPUs and then only one gig of RAM. And that's it. So it's more flexible to, to control that. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, they've also introduced the GPU-based containers. So if you need to use the container instances for the uh, workload that uh, depends on the GPU, you can also request an additional GPU for that. And uh, in central US, uh, 
Uh, it's not available, but we can try to look for, for example, East US. Yes, in East US, you also have the confidential container. The confidential container uh, basically means that uh, you can be 100% sure that if someone will uh, get, uh, if even if someone will get access to dumps of the CPU and memory and so on and so forth, that person will be unable to decipher any of those. So uh, hence the name confidential computing. But in most of my cases, uh, the regular container groups were, were working more just fine. Uh, and uh, yeah, as I was saying here, you're paying for memory for the CPU and for the duration of how long you will use that. Of course, you additionally pay for the regular things in Asia, for example, like uh, for the outgoing traffic, uh, but uh, from the compute perspective, you're paying only for CPU and RAM, and that's it. Okay, interesting, interesting, interesting. It works perfectly. It works perfectly. I was showing the demo with the API because I was actually responsible for creating that API. Uh, but uh, it works even better when you need to deploy, you know, like five or 10 multiple versions of your front end, especially if you need to demo that to someone. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, uh, in our case, we're basically drawing a really, really simple uh, deployment pipeline. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, actually, look, this second pipeline that managed to run on a schedule, uh, it's actually finished. And what we can do, we can go here and I can open this resource group. Okay, and it's not there. Yeah, and it's not there because uh, it was removed. Uh, that basically means that, uh, yeah, I do believe that, yeah, we're, we removed that just because of that, because it was the schedule-based deployment. But anyway, uh, this group is still there. It will be with us for 40 minutes. Uh, after 40 minutes, it will be, it will be removed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So actually it may replace my local containers on my, uh, it's not VM, it's my laptop. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, for example, when you have, well, when you have a big environment and inside that big environment, you may have like 10, 20, 50 different microservices. Okay. And now yeah. you want to check if you will deploy this new version of the microservice, will it be able to communicate and cooperate with other microservices that are there. So you don't want to override the existing. You want to deploy something just next to your infrastructure and check how it will work. There are a lot of cases how you can do that. Uh, and especially if you're actually, if you're actually using the Kubernetes, uh, it will mean that uh, in, in the Kubernetes, you actually have that as the built-in features. But again, there may be reasons why you are not using Kubernetes. Uh, so even if you don't, if you are not using Kubernetes, but you want to use some of the features of the Kubernetes, then you can try to emulate them, let's say, with the approach that I've just showed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anton, can I use this for production? Uh, well, uh, yes and no, because it depends on how exactly you want to use that for production. Uh, because those container instances, when I, uh, when I deploy them, uh, let me just show you that part of the infrastructure here in Azure. Yeah. For example, when I'm deploying this container instance here, uh, in one hand, sorry, in one hand, okay, I can say, this is my FQDN. I can use the custom C name uh, for that FQDN. And also I can uh, map it from port 8088 to port 80 and so on and so forth. But 
if your production uh, is at least somehow related to the enterprise best practices, then you may say, I also want to have the firewall. I also want to have uh, some security policies around that. I also want to have some network isolation and so on and so forth. In that case, uh, that will be really, really hard to implement with the container instances. But uh, if you still want to use that on production, uh, the way how you can utilize that is to use uh, the container instances as an extension, for example, of your Kubernetes. Uh, let me try to find that uh, diagram really, really quick. Uh... Uh, Let me try to find that diagram really quick because uh, there used to be a diagram on the uh, solution center. Uh, probably inside the reference architecture. Let's do Azure, let's do containers. So, uh, and that diagram, it basically shows uh, how you can use the Azure container instances, as I was saying, as a serverless extension of your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the big idea here is that uh, with the Kubernetes, uh, despite its really, really powerful thing, you still have that uh, issue that when you need to scale that, it means that the automation needs to create a new VM and it needs to put that VM into the cluster, which basically means that when you need to scale your Kubernetes, it can easily take, uh, I don't know, maybe like um, five, to 10 minutes, maybe even more. Uh, it depends on a lot of things, actually. Depends on uh, which data center you're working uh, with and so on and so forth, because in some data centers, you may have more resources. In some data centers, you may have less uh, resources. But nonetheless, it will be, let's say, something that you will measure in minutes. Uh Okay, I was unable to find, oh, it's, it's more, okay. Uh, but if you're using the Azure container instances, the Azure container instances can spin up in the matter of seconds, uh, which basically means that with the Azure container instance, uh, you will be able to scale much faster. And in that case, the Kubernetes will just use those as the virtual kubelets and uh, it will use the compute power from those container instances, but the Kubernetes itself will do all the orchestration. Because the reason why the container instances are so cheap is because they provide you with the host only. So zero management capabilities at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. why if you need to install something on the temporary basis, it will work perfectly fine because you don't need to manage something that you will remove in two hours from now. But if you want to have some manageability, uh, then one of the ways how to do that, and I was trying to find that as a reference architecture, but for some reason, maybe I missed that. Uh, I was unable to do that really quick. Uh, so uh, there used to be a reference architecture here, uh, which shows that you can have the Kubernetes as a main cluster. And then when it's time to scale your Kubernetes cluster, you can decide that I would like to scale with the Azure container instances. Uh, because it's it's faster. You can scale that up uh, in a matter of the few seconds. And if you have the huge spike uh, of the workload, it will be much easier for you uh, to keep up. You can also do that in a way that you can spin up your container instances to basically try to handle that huge spike. And then if you see that, for example, uh, the container instances are running for, let's say, an hour already, 
and you still have the the the, the amount of users uh, uh, that is growing then you can say okay let me try to start also creating some virtual machines so i will start basically shutting my containers down uh executing the instances down and replacing them with the fully fledged uh, uh azure virtual machines that are the part of those node pools of my kubernetes in that case that will be much cheaper for you that scalability will be slower but that scalability uh, will be uh let's say cheaper in terms of uh let's say, cost of the CPU and RAM. Nice. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Thank you, Anton. I, I think in my case, it's uh, it's probably applicable to run tests. Uh, yeah. If you want to run some functional tests, uh, you can do that. Uh, that will work actually perfectly fine. Uh, I wanted to implement that, but I just didn't have enough time for that. But this actually was exactly one of the ways how I wanted to use that. I wanted to uh, deploy my application there and then run some integration test or some API test against the deployed version. Uh, another interesting thing that you can do, and I'm also experimenting with that, but to be honest, this is not probably really kind of a fair comparison. So uh, what I'm also trying to do, I'm trying to use those uh, container instances to deploy the temporal version of my application and run some security tests against that. The reason why I was saying that it's not truly a fair comparison is because, again, when you're using the container instances, you don't have any cool stuff like the regular firewall, the application firewall, and so on and so forth. And on your production, you usually have that, okay? But there is still a benefit in that. There's still the benefit in that because when you're deploying that as a container instance, you have that environment. You are not afraid to break it because you have everything, uh, like uh, you have all the things like a standalone dedicated uh, database, uh, standalone dedicated API, and so on and so forth. So you're not afraid to break that. and Security wise, you can check, for example, how application can handle different attacks if the application at some point will not be protected by the uh, by the firewall. Mm -hmm. So if you if if you really want to emulate this scenario, what will happen if the attacker will be able to pass through your firewall and then try to perform the attacks from within your network perimeter, uh, then you can use Azure Container Instances as a temporary host to emulate those attacks. Cool, cool. That's probably not something that everybody wants to test. So it's very interesting in terms of cybersecurity. In terms okay. of cybersecurity, the biggest issue is, is that uh, when you are starting to run your tests, you understand that you need to test this one and that one and so on and so forth. And then you're realizing that your budget for like cybersecurity suddenly uh, became bigger than your budget for the infrastructure itself. Uh so, the best yeah. thing you may not be aware of your issues and live with it for years, but as most of the people do, as most of the company do. This <laughs> is true. Uh, this is true because uh, I can even show that. So um, we're almost ready to launch, to do the public launch of our production. Okay. But what I can show you right now, so for now, we didn't went live. So we do have the uh, production uh, instance of our solution, but for now, we didn't went publicly live. If I will go to failed requests uh, for the identity API, yeah, of course, you can see that someone was trying to access the root, and that's why it returns 404, which is expected. Uh, but let's let me do the following. Let me use last 24 hours. I would like to show you the other thing. Look, once per day, someone 
is trying to check whether I'm having the WordPress here or not and trying to get the WordPress login.php page. Which is to some degree can be considered uh, as uh, as a success because uh, despite we didn't publicly announce that we're live, someone already knows where to find our domains. So at least someone is aware about those products that we are about to launch. Uh, but uh, yeah, look, this is this is what I have in my logs on a regular basis that uh, some someone is trying to find out whether it is a WordPress or not. And I do believe that the next steps will be to start using or abusing some WordPress vulnerabilities to get into my system. I so bet. yeah, I bet <laughs> cybersecurity is a really interesting topic and. Even if you're thinking that you are good, uh, it's it, it's not like that. It's, 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 you you cannot, let's say, you cannot achieve one hundred percent on 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 the security score because uh, the whole security topic is actually the whole security topic can be considered exactly the same as the whole blockchain idea because in the blockchain the reason why blockchain works is because it requires a huge amount of compute power uh, to kind of replace overwrite or fake the uh, the blockchain chain basically the chain of blocks the same uh, is also applicable for the security. So it's not like you can be protected by 100%. Uh, it's more like that you put so much efforts to protect your environment, to protect your system, that at some point for the attackers, it just became too complex and uh, not worth their efforts to try to break into your system. Yeah. You may think that you, uh, your company or your infrastructure doesn't interest nobody, but it's not true. They usually, it's, yeah. it's not true, and we have an evidence here. Look, we didn't went live. Someone is already trying to hack us. Congratulations! <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I don't. I think our attendees uh, are leaving one by one. Uh, uh, let us show uh, our slides. I think we may start with your uh, fundraising and to tell yeah. more about the company. Uh, yeah, so uh, oh, in, in that case, let me do the following. So let me just rearrange those slides then so that will be easier for me to share them. So yeah, started with the fundraising. Uh, you are all aware what is happening in Ukraine right now, and uh, everyone is helping our military with everything they got. Uh, and uh, the thing that I'm doing together with actually quite a big group of people, uh, we are uh, doing the 3D prints. We have a lot of 3D printers, and we are 3D printing a lot of stuff uh, that uh, are used by the uh, military, by the army, for different purposes. Okay, so that can be uh, the details that they use to repair something. That can be the details that they use for the other purposes. But anyway, uh, so if you want also to help us, to participate, to help us to 3D print more, uh, you have the QR code here. Now we have the fundraising to get uh, almost a quarter of ton uh, of uh, of a plastic of a pet G uh, plastic that we need uh, to basically print a lot of things that are requesting from us. Of course, most of the team are working IT and have a good salary. Uh, but believe me, even with the IT salary, it's not always easy to keep printing twenty four seven. Because if you have a good printer, if it's a fast printer, then it will consume. Uh, a filament uh, like crazy and especially if you have more than one printer at your home then it will consume even more so 
if you want uh, to participate, please use this QR code. Uh, please donate. Uh, I will be really appreciated. Yes, I do encourage you to participate. I will share this uh, this link, this link among uh, our employees. Uh, Anton, thanks a lot. Uh, we'll also uh, paste the uh, link to it, to this fundraising, uh, probably everywhere where we are going to publish the record. Uh, so thanks everyone for helping. I do encourage you to participate. Uh, Anton, I may also ask you to share the uh, the presentation we send you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So uh, again, I want to thank All Stars IT for organizing this event, uh, for finding Anton, for uh, persuading him to speak today. Uh, actually, not only I recalled something old, I also found uh, and learned new tricks and I want to test them pretty soon. I hope you also learn something new. And, uh, oh, I I'm not, uh, I'm not presenting, Anton, I'll be asking you to click for another slide. So uh, if you are interested to join, we have plenty of uh, open vacancies, uh, starting from uh, DevOps and data engineers and going to uh, team leaders, to uh, account executives, anything like uh, it's not the whole list we are hiring right now there are open positions in ukraine in different regions in the whole europe in colombia as well we are looking for new people uh, most of them are remote so feel free to join feel free to check what we have and uh, I know that a lot of people uh, from time to time, they uh, send their CVs, they are participate in interviews just to check what do they worth. Please do. Uh, I think uh, our company wants to join, uh, but learn yourself. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, Colombia that is, uh, I'm answering, question from Mikola, uh, the Colombia that is a country in South America. So, Colombia uh, that calls football, football, not soccer. Yes, in uh, the Bogota. Uh, Anton, the next slide, please. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening to this What's slide. happening here? <laughs> yeah, but basically, we're not only providing the uh, out, outsourcing uh, services, we have also R&D services, and I know that we have, uh, have AI lab now. So if you're interested, if you're looking for uh, some companies that may provide you with uh, specific service related to information technology. It may be anything like uh, service administration uh, or server administration or, or looking for your cloud environment uh, or um, taking care of your software projects or AI projects. Uh, contact our sales, contact our managers. So we are always eager to help and uh, we are very flexible. We cover the whole world and we'll be eager to help. Anton, next slide, please. Yep. So <laughs> a lot of professionals, 15 sites in the world, more than 1,000 uh, employees globally more than 100 major tech companies that are relying on us and more than 20 years of experience. Uh, don't be afraid that we are talking about major companies. Like we do 
work mostly with them, but if you are a tiny startup, we may also be helpful for you. So feel free to contact us. It's our pleasure to negotiate, to find some uh, win-win situation that uh, will be beneficial for both of us. And I think we have the final slide. Uh, you may uh, recommend your friend, for example, if you don't want to join us, but uh, you have somebody that might be interested and uh, if they join our company, you may get a referral bonus up to $2,000. I think we had one more slide regarding our social media, yeah. So uh, talking about technical and uh, soft skill some meetups that uh, might be interesting for you, like uh, just follow up our social media. We are on basically everywhere, uh, like good old LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Uh, I think we are on Telegram, on TikTok. So basically you may find us everywhere and follow up our events. I think the next one will be with Igor Fesenko on uh, .NET and collecting uh, telemetrics data. I think it's more uh, focused meetup, but it might be quite interesting for .NET professionals. Thank you for joining us. Anton, thank you for having you here. It was my pleasure. Uh, Docker is something that I work personally with, uh, and you uh, you provided. And me I'm with working some with Docker as well. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do not judge you. You know, <laughs> you gave me some interesting ideas and the, something that I want to test and implement and. Uh, I think I can save a lot of money of, uh, for the current project with those uh, Azure containers. Uh, yeah. I think it will be really beneficial. Thanks a lot. I think we don't have more questions. Uh, Anton, any final words? Uh, I don't know. Uh, probably uh, the thing that... Um... I can also uh, share. So I was basically sharing that uh, uh, fundraising uh, slide, uh, but let me again utilize the opportunity to talk to, to the audience that we have here on the meetup. Uh, if you have, for example, a 3D printer, or if you want to basically join the community that can help you to learn how you can 3D print, all of the different kind of the details, uh, you can actually easily find me uh, because I do believe that uh, in all of those uh, basically advertisements that we put for this meetup uh, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, uh, I was tagged in all of them. So feel free to find me on Facebook and LinkedIn. And if you want to join our community as a person who will help us to 3D print, I will also appreciate that. Great idea. So uh, follow uh, Anton on social media uh, and join his team if you want. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a great evening. If you are listening to us in recording, thank you for doing that. Uh, and let's hope to meet again pretty soon. Anton, it was my pleasure. Good yep. evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.